All right, so I guess we'll get started. Uh, my name is Arun Thomas, and my talk is titled Risk Five: Berkeley Hardware for Your Berkeley Software Distribution. Um, so, how many of you know what Risk Five is? Hands. Well, that's pretty good, actually. So, for those of you who don't know what Risk Five is, um, it's an open instruction set specification. So, it's an ISA. So, you can grab this ISA, and then you can implement cores. You're free to do whatever you want with it. So, it's kind of nice. Um, it's a big deal for open hardware efforts. So. Um, you can just grab the ISA and basically build your own core. Um, and so RISC-V has sort of, uh, you know, modest ambitions. So their goal is to become the industry standard ISA for all computing devices. So, um, so microcontrollers all the way up to supercomputers, desktops, servers, um, basically anything that's running a computer. So they want your disk controllers running RISC-V. They want your IoT devices running RISC-V. Um, so the point that they'll make, the founders of the RISC-V project, uh, Dave Patterson, Chris Dasanovich, is that uh, standardization is important. So I mean, if you look at POSIX and TCP IP, uh, the reason why the computing industry has kind of made the gains that it has is because of standardization. And so the ISA is actually one of the most important interfaces in the computing system. So there's no reason why that should be proprietary. And there's a fair amount of convergence between different ISAs, um, especially just for kind of base um, integer um, instructions. A lot of that stuff goes back to the the mainframe era, and there's a lot of the processors that you see coming out now look fairly similar. Um, and to be a bit more explicit, this is a quote, another quote from the, uh, the RISC-V founders. So our modest goal is world domination. And so since that's our goal is the BSD community, uh, there's sort of a bit of a, sort of a convergence there. I think the marketing folks call it a synergy. Um, yeah. So, and so since they have a fairly ambitious goal, um, I thought we should have an ambitious goal for sort of BSD on RISC-V. And so our goal as a community should be um, for BSD to become the standard OS on RISC-V. And that's actually sort of true now. Um, there's a FreeBSD RISC-V port. It's actually been merged to mainline and it uh, will appear in FreeBSD 11. And so I'd like to see, there's a NetBSD port in progress. Um, I'd like to see ports for Dragonfly and OpenBSD. And so when people do work on RISC-V, when they think about RISC-V, I want people to think of BSD. Um, and I think we have a good shot of that happening. Um, so for, I mean, other platforms, typically uh, platform support will come to Linux and Windows first because of the dominant platforms. But in this case, uh, I think we have a chance to have RISC-V to be the, uh, or for BSD to be the standard platform for RISC-V. So anytime you see, anytime you think RISC-V, I want people to think BSD. And thanks to Kirk for letting me use the, uh, the logo, or BSD logo. Um, so yeah. So here's my talk overview. Um, so my goal is to get you all hacking RISC-V, or at least thinking about it, and hopefully contributing to the various BSD ports. So if there are any uh, Dragonfly or OpenBSD folks here, or NetBSD folks, please contribute, FreeBSD folks. The port's in pretty good shape. There's more work to do. I'll talk about what's uh, left to do. But hopefully I'll get you all sort of at least interested in hacking on RISC-V and at least somewhat knowledgeable about it. Um, so to that end, I'll start off with a little RISC-V 101. Um, so what does the ISA look like at the users, from, the user from the user perspective and from the privileged perspective? Uh, what does the assembly code look like? I'm actually going to show assembly. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit more about the uh, hardware and software ecosystem. What soft cores are out there? Um, what software is out there as well? What operating systems can you choose? Um, are there any hardware developers in the audience? Cool. All right. So for the hardware people, um, this should be particularly interesting to you because um, it's open hardware, you can modify, you can create accelerators. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, um, what that looks like and I'll point you to more resources for that. And then I'll talk more in a bit more detail about the FreeBSD RISC-V port. Um, Ruslan gave a talk at the FreeBSD Dev Summit yesterday. Um, he gave a more detailed introduction to the FreeBSD RISC-V port. So um, mine will be sort of high level, but you should check his talk for all of the details. So with that, let's uh, get started uh, with a little bit of RISC-V 101. Um, so RISC-V is an open instruction set specification. Um, it's not an implementation. There are many implementations out there, and several of them are open source. Many of them are BSD licensed. There are GPL licensed um, implementations as well, and there are also proprietary implementations, sort of your choice. You can build open or proprietary implementations. So the, talk, my, the title of my talk is a little bit misleading, um, just because although there is Berkeley hardware for your Berkeley software distribution, there's also proprietary hardware for your... Uh, BSD as well, so it's sort of up to you what you want to use, and that kind of fits into the philosophy of BSD in general, so you can kind of like do your thing with this ISA. 
Um, so the best thing about RISC-V, from my perspective, is that you don't have to deal with licensing, you don't have to pay any royalties, and you don't have to deal with lawyers. And so, I mean, my company, we have some very nice, hardworking lawyers, but it's my firm belief that uh, the, the less that engineers and lawyers interact, the better. I mean, it's better for everyone's sanity. So this is probably the, uh, the best part about uh, RISC-V. You can just kind of like grab the RISC-V ISA and kind of do your thing get on to building your product or doing your research. So as I said, RISC-V's modest goal is uh, to become the standard ISA for all computing devices, and they're targeting everything from microcontrollers to supercomputers. And so originally it was designed for research and education since it came from Berkeley, and, uh, but also there are companies that are picking up for commercial use. So I personally am doing research on RISC-V because it's a good platform for some of the security uh, work that I'm doing. Um, and there are a number of universities that are using it, um, MIT, uh, the University of Ber California, Berkeley, of course, and then the University of Cambridge. There's a long list of people who are using uh, RISC-V as their ISA in the computer architecture courses, and then there's a number of startups. So I, I'm particularly interested in the education stuff because I actually um, designed the curriculum for an advanced digital design course where students had to create a, a processor. And so we designed a new ISA, and the ISA was not particularly good, um, so if RISC-V had existed then, I would have used it. So I think this will make uh, computer architecture courses a lot more uh, friendly to students. So yeah, I'm very, very excited about RISC-V for all these uses. So they now have a RISC-V foundation, and so there's some pretty big companies that are involved. So you've got like Google, you've got HP, IBM, Mellanox, several of the Mellanox people are here, MicroSemi, NVIDIA, Oracle, Rambus, Western Digital. My employer, BAE Systems, um, low risk. So there's a lot of people who are um, putting money behind Risk Five, and so it's pretty exciting, especially for an open hardware project. Um, so for the origin of Risk Five, you can kind of blame these guys. So Dave Patterson, Chris Dasanovich. So they're both professors at the University of California, Berkeley, and they're the heads of the Aspire Lab. Does anybody know what Patterson's famous for? Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. So Patterson's famous for uh, RISC, the Reduced Instructions on Computer, and he's also famous for RAID, uh, the redundant array of inexpensive disks. He also did a lot of kind of foundational work and clustering and stuff like that. So he's, he's a pretty big deal. Um, and most people will use his uh, computer architecture book either in your undergraduate or graduate computer architecture um, courses. So he's a pretty big deal. He also holds the, uh, the California state record for the deadlift, and he... Uh, he made that record like two years ago, so the dude's a beast, so, yeah. And so Chris Dasanovich is also a really highly well-regarded uh, computer architecture researcher. He's done a lot of really interesting work. Um, he's also been responsible for some of the more recent Berkeley RISC chips, and so the two of them together have done some pretty interesting things, um, interesting research, but also with the RISC-V Foundation and RISC-V in general. So the way RISC-V sort of came about is that when they were starting this Aspire Lab, uh, they do like a new lab every five years and they decided to tackle a big problem. And so when they're starting this lab in uh, 2010, they decided they wanted to have a common ISA for their research. And they've used basically all the ISAs um, over the years, and they, but they decided they should standardize. And so the two main ISAs that are out there, um, the kind of market leaders, are x86 and ARM. And so neither of them are kind of ideal for research. They're both very complex ISAs. I mean, I have the Intel used to send out these printed books of like their, uh, their manuals, and it's like five volumes, and it like fills a bookshelf. ARM's specs are also several thousand pages, so they're fairly complex ISAs. And then there are IP issues. So if you want to distribute your research, if you want to distribute the cores, you can't really do that unless you're willing to pay like royalties and deal with lawyers and all that stuff. So it's not ideal for researchers. Um, so they decided to develop their own ISA. It was meant to be sort of a summer project. Uh, Three months, they'll just kind of come up with an ISA. Um, so it took a little bit longer than that, and uh, initially it was just meant to be for internal use, but over time, more and more people got interested in it. So um, then this whole RISC-V thing sort of took off. And so it took a while, several iterations for them to kind of solidify the ISA. So they released the, uh, the frozen user specification in May 2014, so four years later. And so a little bit more background on RISC-V. So why is it called RISC-V? Um, it's the fifth RISC ISA from Berkeley. So RISC-V or RISC-V, uh, the Roman numeral V. And so the nice thing about RISC-V is it's a modular ISA. So you have a really simple base instruction set and you can layer extensions on top of that. So 
you can have your own extensions. You can design, add your own custom instructions. So if you're a hardware person, it's kind of nice. Um, so there are 32-bit, 64-bit, and hey, even 128-bit uh, versions of the ISA. Supposedly data center people are interested in this, so that's cool. Um, and it's a fairly small ISA, so there's fewer than 50 hardware instructions in the base ISA, so it makes it amenable for really small like microcontrollers and things like that. And it's designed for extension and customization, as I said. So you can build your own accelerators, you can add instructions. Um, that's what it's designed for. Um, so these, there's a number of base integer ISAs. There's one for each address width. So there's RB32I. So the naming scheme is RB32I is RISC-V 32-bit integer. There's R, for 64-bit, there's RB64I. For 128-bit, RB128I. There's also this thing called RV32E, and that's sort of the embedded um, instruction set. It's basically the same thing as the 32 in integer instruction set, except they have the number of registers and drop a couple, uh, some small things. So if you want to build a really small microcontroller, you might consider using that. Uh, there are a number of standard extensions that you can layer on top of the integer um, set, instruction set. Um, and these, you're not required to use these, but they're pretty common. So. If you want a multiplier, there's the M instruction set, which is for integer, multiply, and divide. Um, A is atomics, um, F is single precision floating point, D is double precision floating point. Because these things are pretty common and you want them on desktop and server applications, they've lumped these standard um, extensions into something called the general purpose ISA. So if you're an ARM person, this is, this is kind of the same as like the application cores so for the Cortex-A, so things that are targeting desktops and servers and things like that. Um, so this is, uh, you can actually fit the entire ISA on one sheet of paper, which is kind of nice. Um, so it has a lot of the, and you can actually grab this from the RISC-V website, but it has a lot of the instructions that you want. And you probably can't read this, but uh, it has loads, stores, shifts, arithmetic, um, branches. So it looks like a pretty standard RISC ISA. Um, and then you've got CSRs and things like that for uh, accessing the privileged ISA. Um, and then this, the second, if you flip the sheet over, it shows some of the extensions like the multiply, atomics, and things like that. And it even has space for the calling convention, which is kind of nice that you can fit that on one sheet of paper um, along with all the other instructions and the encodings. So before I get into the ISA, I'll give you a little background on RISC. Um, so RISC stands for Reduced Instruction Set Computer, and typically these are smaller, less complex instruction sets. And they're load store architectures. So if you want to operate, there are no memory to memory operations. Um, if you want to operate on memory, you'll have to load it from a register, load it from memory into a register, operate it on there, and then store it back out. Um, and the nice thing about RISC processors is they tend to be, because they're fairly simple, the ISAs are fairly simple. Um, it makes it easier to implement and it's a bit more efficient. Um, so RISC sort of goes back to Pat, the work that Patterson and Hennessy did in like the early 80s. Um, so Patterson was at Berkeley, and he was working on Berkeley Risk One and Two, and Hennessy about the same time was working on Stanford Risk. So Berkeley Risk One and Two um, direct heavily influenced Spark, and so a lot of the ideas came from there, like register windows and things like that. Um, and then Stanford Risk became MIPS, and it made Hennessy a very rich man. And so Hennessy is now the president of Stanford, and I think he's probably the the richest uh, university president. So he's doing well, um, and still writing computer architecture books, which is cool. Um, so uh, ARM, so a lot of the chips that are out there except for x86 are RISC chips. So uh, MIPS, Power, um, ARM. So ARM now stands for the Advanced RISC Machine. And so if you look at these newer ISAs, ARM v8, MIPS, um, RISC-V, they have, they look fairly similar because they all come from this like RISC heritage. And ARM v8 in particular looks a lot like MIPS because they hired one of the MIPS uh, lead architects. So. It looks fairly MIPSy, and RISC also looks kind of MIPSy as well, just because it comes from uh, the same lineage. Um, so here's the quick, quickly I'll go over the uh, RB64I like registers. So if you're um, doing 64-bit, this is what the register set looks like. So you've got 32 64-bit general purpose registers. This will look pretty familiar if you're using ARMv8 as well. Um, so they're X0 through X31. So X0 is a zero register. Um, it always has the value zero. And by convention, X1 is the return address register. So if you do a call, um, that's where the return address, address gets saved. X2 is the stack pointer. X8 is the frame pointer. So you can find all this information on the, uh, the instruction reference card. And of course, you have a program counter. 
Um, so, as, so RISC-V looks a lot like MIPS. It's sort of a cleaned up version of MIPS um, and a bit more minimal. So it's gotten rid of the branch delay slot and some of the ugly parts of MIPS. And so, <laughs> and so as a result, uh, a lot of the MIPS guides will be useful. Um, so uh, MIPS has a lot of these assembly macros and aliases and things like that. And a lot of those apply to RISC-V as well. So if you look at some of the MIPS books, uh, that will actually be pretty useful. So. The two Hennessy, so sorry for the terrible picture. I'm not a particularly good photographer, but uh, so the two Hennessy and Patterson uh, computer architecture books are good. Computer organization design and computer architecture, a quantitative approach. So if you want to, especially if you're doing hardware implementation, these are good, but they also talk about the MIPS ISA as well. And then there's also CMIPS Run, which talks about uh, how, it talks about the ISA and then also talks about how the Linux kernel interfaces with MIPS. Um, so also a good guide. Um, so as I promised, there will be a little bit of assembly here. So if you actually want to write assembly, you can do that. Um, and when you're doing early kernel boot up, you sort of have to. So this is a very simple program. It'll add one and two. So, um, so this will load the immediate value one into register x1. The, this will load the immediate value two into register x2. And then you've got the add instruction here. It'll take x1 and x2, add it, and put an x3. And assuming your processor is correctly implemented, uh, you'll get three in our register X3, which may or may not be true if you're writing your own core and kind of getting things up and running. So um, in terms of memory operations, uh, as I said, it's a load store architecture. This is the syntax. So you've got LD for load and store for uh, is SD. So if you don't load the value pointed to you by X1 into X0, that's how you do it. And this will store the word next zero out to uh, the memory location pointed to by X1. So it looks pretty standard. I mean, if you're doing any ARM programming or MIPS programming, it looks pretty similar. And of course, you have to have control flow. And so this is what a loop condition looks like. So um, if X1 and X2 are equal, we'll branch to the beginning of the loop. Um, there's a call. This is actually a pseudo op. And this is the same as doing a jump and link. So it'll jump to the func label and put the return address in the RA register. And then a return, also a pseudo op, it's the same thing as doing a jump to the RA register. So it looks pretty similar to other ISAs. George? Um, do you know if there was a reason to put the frame pointer not next to all of the other pointers before we register? You mean in terms of the calling convention? So I, don't, so I don't actually know why. I remember they moved it around, and I thought it was they wanted to optimize some calling convention. And I think David Chisnell actually had them move some of these around because they needed it for like small talk implementations or these kind of like <laughs> dynamic runtime kind of things like JavaScript. So I don't think that, that's not actually the answer, but like they did move around the, uh, the calling convention, and they did some profiling to figure that out. But exactly why it's there, I don't know. But they, I remember they did go through different calling conventions, so. Um, Sir? Yeah, so they do have the, uh, the calling registers are like, ex I forget the exact calling dimension, but yeah. Yeah, so they do have the args here and then something, but yeah, I don't know exactly why it's at x8, but they did play with a few different things with return addresses and things like that. Um, so to look at the privilege spec a little bit more, so RISC-V has multiple privilege levels, which is good if you want to do any security. Um, so at the lowest level, you've got uh, user mode, which is where applications are. Um, level one is where is supervisor mode or S mode. Um, that's where your OS will run. Level two is hypervisor or H mode. Um, that's where your hypervisor, Zen, Beehive will run. Level three is machine mode. That's where your firmware will run. And that's the uh, most privileged mode. Um, and actually, it's the only required level. So for microcontrollers, you can have just a uh, process that just supports machine mode. Um, so um, if you want to do kernel hacking, a lot of what you'll be doing will be kind of twiddling the control and, stati control and status registers, the CSRs. Um, so, these are, so these are heavily used for low-level programming. If you're doing firmware hacking, hypervisor hacking, or OS hacking, you'll get to know these registers fairly well. Um, so there are different registers for the kernel, S mode, hypervisor, H mode, and firmware M mode. So 
the status register, so there's an S status, there's an H status, and an M status. So, uh, and these are used to configure various system properties, memory management unit, interrupts, et cetera. Um, so the machine level status register, the M status, is probably the most important of the CSRs. Um, this holds the current privilege mode. Um, the MMU mode, this is how you um, decide what MMU mode you want to use. Um, interrupt enable, uh, as well as a pass mode and interrupt status. Um, so there's a supervisor, so there's multiple different views of this register. So the supervisor level status register has a restricted view of M status um, because it's less privileged than machine mode. So there's certain things you can only do in machine mode. So the firmware, only the firmware can do it. Um, and so if you want to play with these CSRs, and so a lot of the kernel code does this, um, you'll use the CSR R if you want to read the status right here. And if you're going to write the status, you use CSRW, which stands for CSR write. Um, and it has a lot of the kind of standard exception types you'd expect. So, uh, so for synchronous exceptions, you have something called environment call. This is what you do if you, uh, when you do a system call. Uh, it was formerly called S call, but they wanted to make it more generic from different levels, so now they call it environment call. Um, there are memory faults, there's illegal instructions, breakpoints, um, and of course you've got interrupts, so timer for interrupts for timers, software devices, etc. Um, other important exception registers that you'll be looking at if you're doing kernel code. Um, there's an exception program counter, so this holds the virtual address when uh, you take a fault, so you know where you were coming from. Uh, there's a trap, supervisor trap cause register. This will tell you why this exception triggered. So was it a system call? Was it a memory fault? Was it an illegal instruction? Was it a breakpoint? That kind of thing. Um, and then there's another register, the supervisor bad address register, which holds the faulting address from the memory fault. So you know which address do I have to handle if I'm doing a page fault and that kind of thing. Um, so RISC-V supports a number of different memory modes um, for very simple microcontrollers all the way up to kind of desktops and servers. And this is set using the, uh, the VM field and M status. And so this is how you determine the, uh, the protection and translation scheme. So for microcontrollers, you may not want any translation or protection at all. And so that's what mbare mode gives you. And so this is for CPUs that only support M mode. Um, and this is what the CPU will start up in. So the, when you start up, there's no translation or protection. And the firmware has to kind of set that up for you. Um, there's also base and bounds protection, MBB and MBBID. So this is kind of like Intel segmentation. Thing. And so these are for CPUs that support machine mode and user mode. Um, and then kind of this is what more, we're more familiar with than BSDs. Um, you know, there are also page-based schemes for CPUs that support supervisor mode as well. And so on RISC-V, unlike MIPS, uh, you've got a hardware-managed hardware TLB. So this means the MMU will do the page table walk and a TLB miss. So you don't have to write a TLB handler, a TLB mishandler. Um, and there are up to four levels of page tables, and there are various page sizes from 4K all the way up to 512 gigs. And so the, this, the VM system looks a lot like uh, x86 or ARM v8. So um, one of the more important registers is this SPTBR. That's the supervisor page table based register, and that'll hold the, uh, the page table. Um, so for 32 bit, you'll be doing 32 bit virtual addressing. Uh, that's SV32. Uh, for 64 bit, you have an option. You can either do 39 bit virtual addressing or 48 bit virtual addressing. So on FreeBSD, we're currently doing 39-bit. I believe Linux is also doing 39-bit virtual addressing. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a quick overview. Um, the RISC-V specs have a lot more details, so you should check them out for uh, all, the, all the details. Um, so here are links to the various specs. Uh, there's a new version of the user level spec that was released with some minor tweaks and clarifications that came out this month. Uh, the privilege ISA is in draft. Um, so Version 1.7 was released uh, May of 2015 last year. Um, version 1.9 should be released soon in the next couple weeks. Um, there's also a compressed ISA specification. So this is something like, if you're really worried about code density and you want something like ARM's thumb, that's what this is. And so this is also a draft. And uh, I don't know, if you're an architect or if you're kind of interested in this kind of stuff, um, they have a standardization process. You can also provide feedback on these specifications, which is kind of the nice thing about having a, an open hardware project. You can actually give them feedback. And actually, uh, several of the FreeBSD developers and FBSD developers have provided useful feedback that has caused changes in the spec. So Robert Watson, David Chisnell, um, Matt Thomas, and several other people have all helped out in the specification process. Um, so yeah, that's the ISA at a high level. Now we'll talk a little bit more about the hardware and software ecosystem what cores are there, and then what uh, software exists. 
So in terms of development platforms, um, you have your choice of software emulators. So Spike is the official Berkeley um, RISC-V instruction set simulator. Um, it's also called RISC-V ISOSIM. This is typically what most people do development on, especially if you're doing kind of like early hardware prototyping. Uh, QMU has a RISC-V backend. Um, it's, it works. Um, it's missing some features, but it mostly works. Um, there's also something called Angel, which is a JavaScript emulator. This is actually pretty cool. So you can actually boot up an emulated RISC-V CPU and boot Linux on it um, in your browser. So you fire up Chrome, and then you can see it booting up, which is actually pretty cool. Um, it would be nice to get BSD running on Angel at some point, because uh, it's kind of good. Uh, it's kind of cool. Um, if you want to get an FPGA and start playing around with the hardware, you can kind of pick your poison. So basically, all of the FPGA vendors are supported. Xilinx, Altera, Microsemi, Lattice, it's sort of up to you. Um, the Xilinx Z board is a particularly popular platform. Um, it's kind of what the Berkeley folks have been using. Um, they also use some of the other Xilinx Zinc boards as well. But the Z board's a few hundred dollars, so it's sort of a, it's not cheap, but it's a cheaper FPGA platform. Um, there is no commercially available ASICs yet. Um, there are people who have test chips and people who have internal chips. Um, the low risk folks will probably be the first people to release uh, kind of risk five chips that are available to everyone. So hopefully that's going to happen next year, supposedly. Um, so now I'll go into some of the SOCs and cores that are out there. Um, the nice thing is that all the code's up on GitHub. So if you want to play around with the cores, you can just grab, go to one of these links, grab the code, and play around with it. Um, so from Berkeley, there's, they've got a bunch of different cores. So the Rocket core is kind of the, the main core that people have been using for prototyping um, and building products and things like that. So it's a five-stage pipeline, single issue. Um, there's Boom that was recently released. It's an out-of-order core, so this is one of your more high-performance cores. There's Zscale, which is a microcontroller core, so for these kind of IoT-like applications. Uh, Soder is the set of educational cores from one to five stage. And this is what Berkeley's been teaching in their uh, there are undergraduate and graduate courses. Um, from the University of Cambridge, there's this low-risk project. And low-risk is particularly interesting. Um, so they're actually trying to build a completely open SOC, which is actually pretty hard to do, because most of the stuff is fairly proprietary, and it's not really how hardware is done. But uh, they've got kind of a, they've got a grand vision, so I think it's going to be pretty cool. So uh, low-risk is based at the University of Cambridge, and it's from the same people that bring you the, uh, the Raspberry Pi. So, um, their tagline is that the low risk is supposed to be Raspberry Pi for grown-ups. Um, and so uh, they're doing some pretty interesting things with uh, tagged architectures for security and with I.O., um, with their I.O. offload, with their minion cores. So it's definitely worth uh, checking out. And they're basing their cores on the, uh, the Rocket core from Berkeley. So they're adding things to it and kind of building out the SOC. Um, so Shakti from IIT Madras is also interesting. Apparently RISC-V is a standard ISA for India. So that's kind of interesting, kind of cool. Um, so IIT Madras is doing a lot of work. They've got a big team. And so they're building six open source cores from microcontrollers all the way up to supercomputers, literally. So um, yeah, so it'll be pretty interesting to see what, they're d what they kind of come up with. And so you can grab their code from Bitbucket, not GitHub, for some reason. Um, there's also Yarby, which stands for yet another RISC-V implementation. Um, which is clever. Um, it's really, it's a really small core, and this is what's used in the uh, the Cambridge Computer Architecture course. I think it's written in BHDL. It might be Verilog. I can't remember now, um, but it's pretty small. Um, that's why they use it at Cambridge. Um, ETH Zurich is working on another open SOC. Um, there's something called Pico RB32, which is a really small 32-bit core for microcontrollers and things like that. What's that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So um, this guy, Clifford Wolf, has like a completely open tool chain for uh, like FPGAs and bitstreams and all that stuff. And he kind of reverse engineered the Lattice FPGA format. And so you can kind of do a full tool chain. You can do like a fully open tool chain and RISC-V core um, using this core and his like Ice Storm tool chain thing. So yeah, he's done some pretty cool stuff. Um, Orca from Vector Blocks, uh, they, they're kind of doing something pretty cool with uh, very configurable cores. If you have a lot of money and you want to get a proprietary core, you can try out BlueSpec's RISC-V Risk factory. It's, a, it's pretty nice, actually, but probably expensive. Um, and there are a lot more commercial and open source RISC-V cores that are out there, and more and more are popping up pretty much every day. So. And you can make your own RISC-V core. That's kind of like the nice thing about the, uh, the open ISA. Um, 
So one quick note about the rocket ship, which is the Berkeley kind of standard SOC. They call it an SOC generator. Um, the reason why they call it an SOC generator is because there's a lot of like configurable parameters that you can set and you can kind of build your own custom core. So if you don't, you don't want a floating point unit, you can take that, turn that off. If you don't want certain privileged things, you can turn that off. You can change the cache structure. So it may, they make it pretty easy to do customization. Um, so uh, it's kind of interesting. It's written in a higher level hardware description language. So Berkeley has this thing called Chisel. Um, so it's a DSL written in Scala and it sort of makes uh, hardware, it makes hardware design less painful. So I don't know if any of you have used Verilog or VHDL. It's actually kind of painful. So things like Chisel and BlueSpec make this a lot less painful. Um, so the nice thing about having this uh, Chisel language is that they can actually um, target you can build a C++ um, cycle accurate simulator. You can target the bitstream. You can target a GDS if you want to do an ASIC flow. So it's uh, pretty nice. Um, so in terms of customizing RISC-V, there's a lot of things you can do. So this is sort of an order of difficulty. So there are all these like tunable parameters that you can easily change. Um, if you want to build an accelerator, you can do that. There's this rocket custom coprocessor interface that allows you to have like a, an accelerator. Um, you can also implement your own RISC-V instruction set extension. And if it's interesting, you could even send it up for a standardization. And so if you look at chapter nine of the, uh, the spec, it'll tell you how to do that. And if you have a lot of time on your hands, you can implement your own RISC-V core. And there's a lot of GitHub repos that you can kind of uh, look at for uh, inspiration for that, so. Uh, so that's the hardware landscape. Now I'll talk a little bit about the software that exists. So. RISC-V is sort of coming online, so there's several OS ports that are in different levels of progress. So um, Berkeley has this thing called the proxy kernel. It's basically the smallest kernel you can run, and it only runs a single application. So this is good if you're doing like basically hardware prototyping. If you're doing a lot of software stuff, it's not that useful, but I found it useful for kind of prototyping. Uh, for Linux, there's a number of different distributions that are sort of coming online. There's Pokey, there's Gen2, there's Debian. Debian's just kind of started. And of course, there's FreeBSD and FBSD, and I'll talk a little bit, about, a little bit more about where they stand. Um, there's also SEL4 and Gnode. These are sort of interesting microkernel platforms. And as someone who was paid to work on microkernels, I think they're pretty interesting. You may not, but I do. Um, so uh, there's also support for the primary open source tool chains, Binutils, GCC, Clang, and LVM. So the Clang LVM port, unfortunately, is kind of like, it's sort of coming online. So it's uh, more work needs to be done there. Um, and you'll see when we talk about the FreeBSD port why, uh, why more work is needed. Um, and I mentioned there's multiple simulators and emulators, so there's Spike, QMU, and Angel, so um, you can kind of choose which uh, development platform you want to use. Um, so the kind of common software options that I've seen people use on RISC-V, um, if you're doing really simple hardware prototyping, this proxy kernel thing is a good way to go um, with newlib, which is an embedded libc. It only runs a single user application, and most basically all it does is it proxies various system calls to the host system. So it's a very minimal kernel, but if you're doing hardware stuff, it's pretty great. Um, there's also glibc with the Linux kernel, and there are various, the distributions that are pretty popular are BusyBox, Pokey, and Gen2. Gen2 is not quite there. It's kind of like rotted a little bit. So if you're going to do Linux stuff, I'd probably recommend Pokey, which is an embedded distribution. And, but you really should be using BSD on RISC-V. So, um, so FreeBSD uh, has great support for RISC-V now, and it will appear in FreeBSD 11. Um, are there any NetBSD folks in the room? Okay, cool. So I'm gonna talk about what I know about the status of the NetBSD RISC-V port. Um, so I know that Matt Thomas has been working on a RISC-V port. Uh, core kernel support has been merged, and what I hear is that they're waiting to merge some PNAP changes that Matt has and uh, an updated RISC-V toolchain. Is there anything, do you know anything about the RISC-V port? Okay. So it's in progress and hopefully more people can kind of help and get the NetBSD's RISC-V port up and running. So um, it'll be pretty cool since NetBSD runs on everything, right? So, um, so now I'll dig into a little bit more about the, uh, the FreeBSD RISC-V port. Um, so this is pretty cool. Um, in a very short amount of time, uh, like we now have a FreeBSD RISC-V port and it's probably, and I think it is actually the best supported operating system operating system for RISC-V. So there is a RISC-V Linux port. There's a number of different things, but um, none of them have been merged into mainline, whereas RISC-V, FreeBSD actually has RISC-V in mainline. You can just grab trunk and just do a make build world and distribution, and it's all good. Um, so this is all courtesy of Russlin. Russlin's over there. He did the port. 
and he's done some awesome work with it. So he got the port up and running in like six months. It does SMP, dtrace works. It's, uh, it's some impressive uh, work that he's done. Um, so it's merged current, it'll be in FreeBSD 11, um, and it's based on the ARM v8 port. Um, because ARM v8 and RISC-V have a lot of similarities, it was kind of a good start for uh, RISC-V. Also, ARM v8 is the newest port, so it also is the cleanest port. Um, and if you're interested in ARM v8, there's been a couple journal articles about the ARM v8 porting process. Uh, so the FreeBSD RISC-V port targets RB64G, so the 64-bit general purpose um, ISA, and then we're using 39-bit virtual addressing. So unfortunately, we're using GCC as the tool chain um, because the Clang port is not ready. Are there any Clang LVM hackers? Yes, so you, sh you guys should work on RISC-V. Cool. <laughs> yeah, so the problem is that the, the port is sort of just kind of coming online, so it's not quite there. Um, there is a tree that's hosted on the RISC-V mailing list. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I don't know, if you guys are gonna be around Boston in July, you guys, there's a RISC-V workshop. It'd be good to get some more LVM people there, so. But yeah, we can talk offline. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's like, it's pretty early, and I know there's multiple people who are kind of working on it, but yeah, it would be great to get uh, more people working on Clang and LVM. Um, so if you wanna look at the FreeBSD RISC-V code, here are the key source directories, it's all under sys RISC-V. Include is where the headers are, and RISC-V is where the various source files are. And the kind of key configuration files you want to look at under sysconf and sysriscviconf. So files.risc5 tells you the files that are going to be built, and these files will tell you the, uh, the kernel configuration, build options, and that sort of thing. Um, so I'm going to kind of go over the typical boot process and how the kernel boots up. Um, so in general, this is true on all architectures. You have some kind of firmware, and then you have a bootloader, or multiple levels of bootloaders, and then the kernel runs. And so the firmware and the bootloader um, basically, their job is to basically set up the environment so that the kernel can do its thing. Um, and so they do, together they do some hardware initialization like DRAM and serial. They'll pass various boot parameters of the kernel and they'll load the kernel. Um, some of the typical options you'll see on, in, in embedded context, you'll see some kind of SOC ROM. U-Boot is a fairly popular um, bootloader in these environments. And then on FreeBSD, you'll run Loader8. Um, on desktops and servers, um, UEFI is kind of the thing to run as the uh, kind of firmware, and then you'll run Loader8 um, as the bootloader on FreeBSD. Um, so Berkeley has this, their bootloader for RISC-V is something called BBL or the Berkeley bootloader, and so this is the firmware and the loader. Um, and because I like ASCII art, I took a picture of what happens when uh, you load this up. So this is the RISC-V logo, and you have the slogan that uh, Instruction sets want to be free. So that's the, uh, the official RISC-V slogan. So unfortunately, you don't see this logo when we use, uh, when you boot FreeBSD on RISC-V. Well, there's, the reason why is that we don't actually use BBL for uh, FreeBSD. And that's mostly because of, for ease of development. Um, so we can actually just boot a standalone kernel image. Um, and so it re-implements some of the firmware functionality. Um, in the long term, we'll probably split that stuff up and then will follow, there's no actual boot architecture spec for RISC-V. A lot of the platform stuff and boot architecture spec stuff hasn't been specified yet, but as that stuff sort of gets, uh, gets firmed up, uh, we'll follow that specification, probably have a separate firmware and a bootloader and things like that, and eventually port loader rate and all that stuff. Uh, so currently we're using device tree for configuration. Um, the new version of the RISC-V privilege spec, which should come out in a couple weeks, specifies a simpler structure to encode the same information. So we'll probably end up doing the like official RISC-V thing there. Um, but since we're using device tree now, I'll mention, I'll talk about it a little, talk about it briefly. Um, so device tree is uh, used on Linux and FreeBSD on several architectures. Um, I think it comes from PowerPC originally. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> and so it's a data structure that describes uh, hardware configuration. And so if you wanna um, look at the hardware configuration for Spike, the RISC-V instruction set simulator, um, this is what it looks like. So this is the timer. Um, and so I'll tell you what the timer is, what the interrupts are, what the clock frequency, and it's like a convenient way to kind of describe devices. Um, and by having device tree, you can get to a generic kernel um, that boots on all um, different RISC-V chips or ARM chips and things like that. Uh, but it looks like Berkeley's moving away from this to sort of a simpler structure. Um, so now I'll talk a little bit, so now that we talked about booting, I'll talk a little bit about what happens when you, the kernel boots up. Um, so the first thing it does is some early kernel initialization, 
and I'll walk through a couple code snippets related to this. Um, so I'm leaving out a lot of details, but a high level what happens is it'll set up an initial page table and enable the MMU. That's one of the first things it does. It'll set up an exec exception vector table and handlers so that it can handle exceptions. Um, after that's done, it'll initialize devices like serial and timers for the clock tick. Um, once you do all that kind of uh, machine-specific stuff, you get into the machine-independent part of uh, the kernel. And this is where you initialize the various kernel subsystems, do more device initialization. There's a lot of stuff that happens here, and I'm not really going to talk about it. Um, if you look at chapter, what chapter is it, George? 20 or something? Uh, it's always the last chapter. So the last chapter of the free... Okay, so the last chapter of the FreeBSD design implementation uh, book has pretty detailed information on what happens when FreeBSD boots up. Um, so after all that stuff happens, all the various kernel subsystems go um, or run, then eventually you'll enable interrupts um, and then switch to user mode and run init, which is the first uh, user mode process. And then your various RC scripts will run and all that stuff. Um, so this is kind of like a quick overview of what happens when you boot up the CPU on any uh, architecture. Um, so on RISC-V specifically, um, so the first thing that runs is uh, there's the start symbol is the first, uh, the start routine is the first routine that runs. And you can find that in lowcore.s. And so I'm leaving out some details. Uh, you can look at Russell's talk for the full details. But uh, at a high level, you'll set up a stack and initial page table. And then you'll switch to super, supervisor mode and then enable the MMU. And so if you look at this code, I've left out some stuff. but this is how you set the page table. Um, you, use this, you write to the uh, SPTBR, the page table base register, and then you can exit from machine mode into supervisor mode um, using this ERET. And once you do that, you're in supervisor mode, you're out of machine mode um, in the kernel. Um, you also want to set up an exception vector table to handle exceptions. Um, the way the RISC-V is set up is you have a different, you have a separate vector for each mode. So there's a mode. So there's a vector for user mode, supervisor mode, hypervisor mode, and machine mode. So RISC-V, we don't, there's no hypervisor spec yet, so we don't support hypervisors. Um, and then we don't expect uh, traps for machine mode either. Um, and there's also the reset vector, which is where um, the start routine um, gets run from, or yeah. Um, so once start does that stuff, it sets up the initial page table, it switches to supervisor mode, it'll continue execution. Um, and then it'll set up the environment for C code because you don't want to write your entire kernel in a assembly. I mean, you can, but it's uh, a little bit maddening. Uh, so yeah, you'll set up the environment for C code and then you'll call the first C function, which is init risk five. So that's a machine dependent risk specific function. Um, I think on other platforms it's called platform init or like hammer time or something like that on AMD 64. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. And so, uh, this is how you continue the, uh, so this will continue to do machine specific uh, initialization. Um, and if you look at the mockdef.c, the machine dependent.c file, um, you can find the details there. Um, so it'll map the devices, initialize the console, set up a real page table, switch to it. So you can follow the details there. Um, uh, so eventually it'll get through all that stuff and then doing all the machine dependent stuff. And then finally it'll call mi startup, which is the first machine independent function. And this is the same across all architectures, um, and so then you see the uh, the copyright notice, and you know that all is right with the world. Um, so, uh, and so this is sort of th once this happens this is when you get into the uh, you initialize the various kernel subsystems, and then get all the way up to init and do the RC stuff. So, boot will continue. Um, so, when the processor is when the kernel is booted up all the way, a lot of what the kernel is going to end up doing is basically handling exceptions. So. Um, handling system calls, handling page faults, um, illegal instruction, exceptions, all that kind of thing. So at a very high level, very quickly, I'm going to just mention what happens when you handle exceptions. Uh, so the first thing you'll do when you handle an exception is you'll save the context. There's an assembler macro called save registers, um, and you can find that in exception.s. And then you'll call either do trap user, or do trap supervisor, depending on if you're coming from user mode or from supervisor mode, and that's in trap.c. And then there's this s cause register that I mentioned earlier, and so that's how you just determine what uh, what exception triggered. Are you supposed to handle a system call now? Or are you supposed to handle a memory abort? Um, so there's a switch around that cause, of the s cause register, and depending on what uh, what s cause has in there, you'll jump to the appropriate handler. So if it's a page fault, you'll run data abort. If it's a system call, you'll run I think it's called SVC handler. Um, 
So once, you, once the kernel handles the exception, it'll restore the context and return back to the previous mode. So there's an assembler macro called uh, load registers that'll do that. And you'll call an eret to get back to the previous mode that you're in. And that's an exception.s. So this is a pretty high level. I just wanted to kind of give you a high level overview of what this looks like. And you can kind of dig into the code for yourself as a homework, uh, an exercise for the reader. Um, so if you want to develop FreeBSD on RISC-V, um, you should go to the wiki page. It has all of the details um, and lots of information linked in there. But you can just run build world and build, build kernel, and I guess build and distribution as well. So um, you can run make target arc is RISC-65, RISC-564, and a build world. And then you can do the same thing, build kernel. Um, since I want to run on spike, you tell, you use the uh, spike kernel configuration. And then you can just boot up spike. In this case, I'm booting with one gigabyte of memory and then uh, two processors, so it's running SMP. You give it the disk image and you give it the kernel. Um, full details are on the wiki, but it's actually pretty easy to do now. Um, and FreeBSD supports uh, Spike, the official RISC-V simulator, QMU, and then also supports Rocket on the Xilinx Z board. And this is the Z board um, if you wanted to get one. Um, so there's a number of things that, so RISC-V has come along, FreeBSD RISC-V has come a long way, um, but there's some things that still need to be done. Um, it would be really nice if we could package up the RISC-V simulators in the tool chain, so Spike and QMU, GCC and binutils. If we could put those in ports, it would be a lot easier for people to just kind of, you know, just install the packages as opposed to having to build that stuff themselves. Uh, there's a lot of Clang LVM RISC-V backend work to be done. Um, we want to update to the new privileged ISA once it's released. Um, it would be nice to have ports on RISC-V. Um, so if there's any ports people, it'd be great to kind of get that going. And a QMU user mode would also be useful, um, and that would help with some of the FreeBSD port stuff. Um, so there's a lot of RISC-V resources that are out there. The most important ones are the specifications. Um, you should check those out for the full details about the ISA. Um, the RISC-V, there's been three RISC-V workshops so far, and the proceedings are online, a lot of interesting talks. Um, there was a tutorial at the HPCA conference, High Performance Computer Architecture. Um, if you want to do, it talks a lot about how to get going with the software stack and the hardware stack. So for the hardware engineers, there's some uh, tutorials on how to build accelerators with RISC-V and things like that and how to modify the, SA, modify the ISA. There's are mailing lists. There's even a stack overflow. Um, there's a couple of articles in Microprocessor Report if you're kind of new to um, RISC-V and you, you kind of want to know about the philosophy and kind of just get a general overview. Both of these articles are pretty good. Um, for FreeBSD RISC-V, the wiki page has all of the information and includes the other stuff uh, mentioned here. There's an IRC channel you should join. There's a mailing list. Uh, Ruslan gave a talk at the RISC-V workshop. The slides and the video are available. And Ruslan also posted a video of FreeBSD RISC-V in action, so you can see uh, RISC-V booting on Spike, QMU, and the FPGA. And it's like a half hour, so you can see like there's a lot of stuff that happened. Um, so also, I'm helping to co-organize the, uh, the fourth RISC-V workshop. Um, it's going to be in Boston, uh, technically Cambridge. Um, it'll be at the MIT Status Center. Um, I'm really excited about this because it's a couple miles from my house, and I've been kind of lobbying. I and many others from Boston have been lobbying uh, the RISC-V folks to have a, a, a conference on the East Coast, especially in Boston. So um, if you are interested, um, you should join. It should be pretty cool. It's a pretty interesting mix of like computer architects, OS people, compiler people, like lots of application people. So there's people who are reporting Go to RISC-V. So yeah, there's a lot of pretty interesting stuff happening. So you should come check it out. Uh, so in summary, uh, RISC-V I think is pretty exciting. So uh, it's uh, especially for open hardware efforts. So um, RISC-V is a, a new open instruction set specification. It's not an implementation, it's a specification. Um, there are open source implementations, there are proprietary implementations. You can do what you want with the specification. You don't have to pay any royalties. Um, you don't have to consult any lawyers. You can just kind of do your thing. Um, and it's a good platform for computer architecture research and education. Um, lots of people are doing pretty interesting research and uh, there are a lot of interesting courses um, using RISC-V. It's also a good platform for open hardware and commercial products, so it's worth checking out. And the most exciting thing is that it runs FreeBSD now and you guys should I'll try it and uh, contribute um, because it's pretty cool. Um, and so I hope to see you all at the fourth Risk Five workshop. Uh, it's July 12th and 13th. I forgot to mention that. And if you have any questions, you can email me, and I'm also happy to take questions now. Thanks.
there's no trap. I'm not sure. So there's no trap on overflow. Um, there was some discussion about uh, something about the encryption thing, but I don't know enough about it. Russell, do you know anything about it? No. Okay. Yeah. There was a thread about that. I don't remember what the details were. Um, but yeah. 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 There is an archive. Um, you could also post a message to the mailing list too. But I don't really know much about. I remember seeing the discussion, but I didn't read it very carefully because I'm not a crypto person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Just a request, uh, when someone asks a question, can you repeat the question? So oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, what was the question again? It was something about uh, encryption. Yeah, OK, sorry. Go, go. Uh, so the question was, how big of an FPGA do you need to run uh, FreeBSD on RISC-V? Um, so I think the FPGA that the Z board has is a Z20. Uh, you could probably run FreeBSD on the Zybo. I think it's, so I think the Z board has a Z7020, uh, Zinc FPGA. I don't remember how many LUTs and DRAMs it has in there. It's not a very big FPGA though. Yeah. I think you can probably run uh, FreeBSD on the Zybo as well, and that has a 7010 on there. Um, the 7010, because it's fairly small, you don't get an FPU on there, but uh, FreeBSD is actually only doing soft float, now, soft float now, so you can maybe get it running on the Zybo as well. Sorry, did you have a question? Uh, Lattice is one of your sponsors. Does that mean uh, Mockett Pro or ICE is a target? ICE is a target. Um, people ICE have. 40? ICE 40? Yeah. Yeah, so my understanding, so I don't know, I know that people have targeted ICE 40. I don't know about the others. Um, I personally haven't. Uh, I did get one. I have a lattice board now because they were giving some away, but I haven't actually um, tried it yet. So. Um. Uh, just one question. Uh, how difficult is it to get it to some budget or to some size of the project? I know uh, when you are running it, it's very tough. So. Uh, so the question was, how difficult is it to kind of build a core and kind of do that? Um, do you, it's actually not that hard. Um, so even if you aren't a hardware person, um, the, there's make targets for this sort of thing. You have to install the tools and everything. But that part's actually not that hard. Um, there's going to be some there's going to be some tutorials at the Risk Five workshop and actually doing modification. Um, if you want to just tweak your core, like modify the cache structure and things like that, you go into this one like header file basically, and so that's pretty easy to do. You just want to build it. Yeah. So that's actually pretty easy. Um, if you you'll have to install the uh, the tool chain, um, you'll have to install the Xilinx tool chain, and then beyond that, there's a make target. It's like make fsim or something like that. So it's yeah, 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 yeah. I wonder if you could run it under uh, the the Linux emulation layer, it's yeah. possible. Yeah. Oh, yeah, OK. It's Bovado. Oh, it's bad, OK. I don't know. So the question was, can we shame commercial EDA vendors? They probably don't care. They're making so much money, though. <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think, I think the ice storm stuff is pretty exciting. So I think, um, yeah. So I mean, I think there are some people working in open tool chain, so that's exciting. But yeah, I think it's going to be hard. I mean, they're making so much money. Uh, you had a question? That's true. Yeah. 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 Which is what most people want to do. I don't know of any. Yeah. Is there a question? Yeah. Sorry. Okay, so the question was, what is the difference between, uh, what's the kind of speed differential between RISC-V and other architectures? Um, I don't think there's been a lot of analysis of this. Um, so there was one, um, risk, some of the RISC-V folks compared one of their cores to one of the ARM, 
I think it was a Cortex A5, and it was pretty comparable. It was like similar performance for maybe, um, similar performance at lower power, um, but there hasn't been a lot of uh, serious uh, kind of comparisons or shootouts for this sort of thing. Um, the ISA itself, um, I don't think should cause any like performance degradation. It's pretty, if you look at it compared to other ISAs, it's pretty similar. So it really comes down to having really good implementations. And so um, basically once more people start building RISC-V implementations, that stuff will get better. The Berkeley implementations are pretty decent. Um, they don't really have the really high performance like, um, like Intel desktop cores or even like the Cortex-A72 or whatever. They don't have anything like that. I think Boom eventually might get there and then there's other people like LG and various people who are like kind of playing around with the risk vibes. So I think uh, high speed implementations will come over time. I, I Brooks? Yeah, so, so the, yeah, so the CMOVE stuff, I think it may get added as like an extension. Um, it probably won't be in the base ISA, but I can see a case for that. And once the standardization. I see, yeah. So I think, I think you should hop on the, uh, the ISA dev mailing list and uh, bring that up. I think David Chisholm also brought it up. But, uh, so yeah, I think, I think it would be good to kind of share that analysis. And so it could be part of, so they have a number of different extensions. And so it would be good to have another extension that has CMOVE, I think. And if there's an implementation and like a kind of a, a spec for that, I'm sure they'll consider it at least. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's some of these things where like people want uh, sort of like different bit operations and things like that. So people have a lot of different specs. And once we get more workloads and more people, more chips and more workloads, we'll kind of do better there. Um, any other questions? So the question was, uh, what's the strategy for getting more RISC-V silicon out there? Um, I think it's something that's just gonna happen over time. Um, so people are building more chips, more people are using RISC-V, so I think it's mostly a matter of time. Um, in terms of like getting more silicon out there, I think the foundation, the RISC-V foundation is doing work on kind of getting more people interested. Um, so there's some pretty big uh, members of some, like, so like NVIDIA joined the RISC-V foundation recently, IBM did. Um, low risk, I think, will be releasing um, some silicon hopefully next year. And so this is something that developers can get their hands on. So I imagine it's a matter of time. People are building silicon, but it's like internal. So it's more uh, maybe in a couple of years' time, we'll see more of that. Um, sorry. Just a comment on that then. Um, so with Fed, so they should have test chips coming out sometime this year. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, if, uh, so the comment was that uh, RISC-V should have a uh, test chips coming out this year, so that would be great. Um, and I know they're working pretty hard towards that, so I know Alex Bradbury, and they've, they're very, they're pushing really hard to make that happen, um, and which will be pretty cool. Um, any other questions? Cool. So yeah, everyone, oh, sorry, good. What's your, how do you get more uh, So I worked on this kind of large DARPA project, um, so I, I'm a researcher, um, so I worked on the DARPA crash safe project, and so we were trying to build a, basically a completely secure hardware software stack. So we built a new processor, we designed a new ISA, we built a new operating system in research languages and things like that. And actually the Cherry work that Brooks and Robert Watson um, worked on, they were also funded by the same project. And so we had this completely new processor with this new ISA. Um, the only problem with that is that none of your existing applications would run on it. And so what we've been doing is bringing some of those security extensions to RISC-V. So that's how I've been working on this stuff. And so I've also, I was also, I mean, I was, I originally when I was in school, I went to school and I was doing computer architecture and I wanted to be a computer architect. And somehow I ended up moving over to like operating systems and virtualization and security and things like that. And so this, it's also a personal interest of mine to kind of get this stuff going. And 
I've worked on a number of open hardware, worked with a number of open hardware efforts over the years, but I think this one has, uh, I think this one probably has the highest likelihood of success just because of all the people behind it. They've built up an open hardware community. Um, they've got this standardization process, the foundation, so I think it's pretty exciting. So I think uh, some cool things should happen. Another question? Yep. If, so, if Intel was going to try to attack you or yep. whatever happened. So one thing David Patterson has been doing is he's got an analysis on the website that shows each of the RISC-V instructions and the when it was implemented in some previous processor. So it, that will clear up the patents at least for the base integer ISA. Um, the RISC-V Foundation has also made a pledge that they're not going to sue anyone. They're trying to basically uh, create this open ISA. Um, and then there's the foundation is going to kind of get set up and I think they'll if there are patents, there's probably going to be some sort of like patent, I don't know, thing where you're okay if you are a member of the foundation or if you're an open source developer. But for the base ISA, they've actually gone through. And all these things, if you look at the things that are in the base ISA, it's like control flow, add, addition, arithmetic, that kind of stuff. That stuff's been in there since the mainframe era. So like there's no patents for that kind of thing. And then for the other extensions, they've been kind of working through like working through that stuff basically. Yeah, So none of that, so like Thomas Sula's algorithm, the superscalar design, that stuff, that's not like under patent. But some of that stuff will be. So the implementers are going to have to sort of figure that out. So I think the patent issues will will figure it out over time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. And the other thing I hope over time is that some of these uh, vendors will also just use RISC-V because there's no, they're basically just, there's no reason not to um, in the long term just because the ISAs aren't that different. So it's possible that some of these vendors may use um, RISC-V in the future, hopefully. So that would be good. Um, any other questions? Cool. Thanks a lot. Uh, hopefully you'll go to the RISC-V workshop and try out a RISC-V. Thanks. <laughs>